You see it on Zoom yet? Oh, okay. Got it. Okay, great. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for sticking around for this final leg of the uh, journey this week. It's been a great conference, and I've really enjoyed the time here. Um, we're going to talk about dynamic linear setback maps today and a little bit about what we've learned in the process of designing and building these tools in terms of how we work as well, if we, if we have some time. I'll just briefly introduce my farms to you all. We're a custom software development company, and we custom build exactly what enterprises need to be successful in working with farmers. Uh, we've been doing this for about a decade now, and we work with uh, enterprises like ADM, BASF, Cargill, and other, other large uh, companies, uh, but we're also doing more and more work with NRCS uh, in collaboration with uh, Purdue University. Uh, we, we've experienced firsthand the power of integration, meaning custom building application programming interfaces, APIs, that are designed from the ground up to exchange data between our system and other systems so that uh, data that needs to be brought to, uh, together can be brought together in a way that's fully automated and seamless from the, the user's point of view. Uh, as I mentioned, we are working closely with uh, Purdue and, and national leaders at NRCS, several of whom are on the call this morning. And uh, it's very much a team effort. I'll, I'll kind of talk about that a little bit more here in a, a few minutes. Um, Purdue University has been, uh, in fact, let me explain to you, if you're not familiar with MMP, let me give you kind of the, the cliff notes here. Uh, it's a desktop application built in Delphi that is downloaded from the web and then run on your local desktop. So it's uh, sort of a, an older way of thinking about technology and about using technology. Uh, and Purdue built it over the course of uh, you know, a quarter century. Uh, over that time, it has uh, grown to contain state specific uh, requirements around how manure can be managed. Uh, and specifically, uh, it calculates the uh, flow of manure off of a livestock operation based on number of head, average weight, feed ration, et cetera. It contains the policy for how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium can be applied uh, to area fields, whether it be on farm or exported from the farm. And it also has the state specific uh, phosphorus index, which is how NRCS at, at a state level uh, provides feedback around whether a grower is inbounds or out of bounds from a phosphorus management point of view. The, the primary motive or goal for using MMP uh, is to size manure storage capacity, make sure you've got enough storage uh, for the herd that you've got on farm and enough farmland uh, to manage the manure. Uh, it also produces the CNMP, which is compliant with the 590 standard, which you have to have if you're going to use government resources to fund uh, your storage facility. So at a high level, that's what MMP is for those of you who might not be uh, really familiar with it. Uh, our goal in this build is not to rebuild MMP. MMP is a massive uh, application and that, that will take some time. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to create a complementary tool, a mapping tool that meets the setback requirements of the CNMP. So we're just gonna grab that little section of a very large document and produce, uh, hopefully, beautiful maps that, uh, that users enjoy having. Um, specifically, NM Tracker has been used in this capacity in the past, uh, or just until recently, uh, but they have decided to deprecate it. They'll be no longer, uh, they're not, not going to be supporting it going forward, uh, as you can see here on their website. And so we decided to take the initiative and try to build something that uh, builds on what they've done, but, but hopefully sort of advances the state of the art uh, as well. So as I mentioned, our goal is to make it easy to create beautiful manure setback maps. And I know those words don't often go together in common vernacular, but that's how we feel about it. We want to create beauty in this process, and uh, we want to create a very professional uh, output for TSPs who are professionals in their own right, and uh, of course on behalf of producers. So the manure setback PDF is the primary sort of digital product that will come out of uh, this, this process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, very much a team effort. Uh, this is not, in fact, our ideas have often sort of seeded better ideas. And so uh, we're working with the science and technology group within NRCS, uh, both on the sort of animal uh, waste management side, but also on the uh, water quality side, uh, working with technical service providers and just getting their sort of 
perspective from their firsthand experience on the ground, uh, dramatically improve the way we think about these tools and, and uh, we factor that into the design and the implementation. And then also uh, the Farm Production and Conservation Business Center, which is essentially the, the development arm for NRCS and few, a few other agencies. Um, their staff has sort of weighed in on what they think of as best practices here as well. So uh, these ideas are a collection of, of all of this input uh, along the way. So the question for you is what have we missed? What, what ideas do you have? As we go through this, uh, can you see opportunities to improve or, or, or automate a step or uh, refine a step? Uh, so please uh, don't hesitate to uh, raise a hand or stop me along the way and say, hey, what about this? What about that? We'd be glad to capture that along the way and uh, see if we can incorporate you know, those, those thoughts in the future. What I wanna do is uh, go ahead and switch out of PowerPoint mode and actually run a live demo, uh, which you know is always fun, especially with a brand new system. This, in fact, this version of My Farms was released last night. We put just a few finishing touches on it, and um, I'm excited to share those with you today. Um, one of the things we just added is this navigation assistant off to the right. So rather than just talking about the steps through the process that farmers need to take, we decided to create a highly dynamic way of providing feedback about where they're at in the process. So in this case, the user sets a year and the destination they've set is the MMP download. So this is a, a download to be used with MMP as a companion. So that's why we call it MMP downloads. It's a simple three-step process. And it starts by with adding fields in the account. The second step is of course to add setback maps to those field boundaries. And then finally to download the PDF uh, that I just mentioned. And so if I was just getting started, now you can see I've already got six fields in this account. So at a glance, I, I can see I've got six fields added, but maybe I have uh, 20 fields that should be created. And so when we talk about fields, let me explain one important concept. And this came from one of our colleagues. Some TSPs like to have uh, one field boundary per page in their CNMP. Some of them like to have a collection of field boundaries that are all tied to the same farm. <clears throat> And so that insight, you know, we, we took to heart. And so in this case, I've got two field boundaries. One's called Griffith North, the other is Griffith South, and they're both tied to the Griffith farm. We're gonna create one image per farm, not one per field. So that way the TSP can decide how many images they want and how they wanna sort of organize these field boundaries. So we're gonna create one image for Griffith, one for Moser and one for Smith, even though we have six field boundaries. And the TSP can control the relationship between fields and farms. So that's, we learned is, is quite important in this particular use case. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and work. Uh, why, don't I, why don't I show you one of the three methods for defining field boundaries? That is by far and away the most difficult part of this process or typically is. With an NM tracker, for example, the user had to drop every point around the boundary. And so we wanna see if we can improve on that. So we're gonna click on add field. And we're going to say, yes, we have data in another system already. And we're going to go ahead and upload that as a shape file in this system. So any system on the market will support exporting field boundaries to shape. So we're just going to click on add files. Click on this zip folder that contains uh, a number of shape files. So will take just a minute to unzip it. All right, so looks like that zip folder contains seven field boundaries. So the fields are named according to how they were in the other system. They're organized uh, by farm the way they were in the other system. And uh, the operator here is set as well. So we'll just click save. And now instead of six field boundaries, we'll have 13. All right, so now you can see in the nav bar, we now have 13 field boundaries. And maybe that's complete. So we're, we're good to go, we're ready, ready to take the next step. I might circle back on the other methods if we have time or, or interest <laughs> later on. But I'm gonna click go. Now this is gonna give me a shortcut to the next step in the process. I can see I don't have any setback maps. I've got a red X, I better go do something about that. So I click go. Here I've got the ability to start a new plan for January. Now these are my field boundaries all 13 of them, 
I'm going to go ahead and select all of them. I'm just moving on, move them on through the process. Now I've got a few feature maps predefined. I did that last night. And so here's what we mean by a feature map. It's every, in fact, let me just add one for you. So here I've got three features. Features are defined at the state level. Every state has a, 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 their own unique set of features and their own set of um, application criteria, and each one has their own setback distance. So we wanted to, to automate as much of that as we could. So if we add a new feature, let's say I want to add a, um, a well. Maybe there's a private drinking water well close by here. So I just tell the system what I want to create, and then the drawing tools automatically uh, become available. The proper drawing tool, in this case, it's just a point. It could be a polygon, or it could be a line, or it could be a point. But the database tells us which of those it should be. So I've just dropped my point, and now I've added a water well to this field. Okay, so I can see with glance I've got three fields have feature maps. Three of them do not because I just added the field boundaries. I'll go ahead and just do one of these. So here it is. Let's do... Let's handle that intermittent stream that's down in the middle there. So in this case, I've got a line drawing tool. The important thing about how we've handled features is that you only have to define them once per all time. So once the features exist, they can be used in the future for future plans. You don't have to do this every time you wanna create a setback map. Whereas with other tools, you had to start from scratch every time, which was a bit uh, problematic. So I just click the last point to finish it. And uh, I could, I'll just quickly do one more. We'll add a, a property boundary. And we'll just make sure we've got a little bit of buffer around this, this other property down here. All right. So now we've got another field with a feature map. Let's go ahead and click next. We can come back to this if you wanna go deeper on any of this. Uh, we'll click next. All right, now what we need to do is for the fields that have feature maps, we're gonna create the setbacks now. And so let's take the Griffith farm and uh, I'm gonna nickname this. I'm gonna nickname it uh, Frozen broadcast. So this exposes to the user the application criteria options they have and the relationship between how they apply manure and their spreadable acres. So what we're showing dynamically here is that if you set a, a setback of, of say 100 feet, you're going to take 0.1 acres out of production in this case. Or a better example is a 200 foot setback around that, that intermittent stream. We're taking 6.2 acres, not out of production, but out of out of manure application. Uh, so the, that area is the area of the setback where manure cannot be applied. And so if we were to go with a different method, then our setback is reduced and our uh, the area in that setback is reduced as well. So when we talk about dynamic manure setback maps, it's really about helping the user understand the relationship between how they manage manure and the amount of area that they can't apply manure to. All right, so then we would we would do that for each of the fields that has a... Um, now in this case, we found that exact application criteria available for another feature, and so we set it automatically on behalf of the user. Uh, no reason to have them click through every single one because they're probably doing the same thing across the whole field, but if they do change practice around that feature, they can manually override what we just did. The goal is to make it easy for the user uh, without... Uh, without creating unnecessary steps. I'm gonna call this one frozen. Um, let's do one more. Let's call, let's do um, not injected. Not frozen. There we go. Now, the reason we're giving these a nickname 
is because TSPs, we learned, often like to have a few options in their 590 plan, or they might even show the user what, what the impact will be of different practices. And they might print off both maps and say, okay, this is what it looks like if you inject this manure, here it is, if you broadcast and then incorporate it, for example. Um, once we've done that, we can essentially get a preview of what the manure setback map looks like. And as I mentioned, we group these by farm. So here we have two field boundaries. Their, their names are superimposed at the centroid of the field boundary. And then uh, they're both associated with the same farm. So this is how TSPs can control the number of boundaries that are in the image at one time uh, based on their own, their own personal preference. Um, we do have the northing indicator and the scale, which is a part of the National Nutrient Planning Handbook. And so uh, we're compliant with uh, government regulation. Um, there's, you know, there's more examples here we could look at, but I think I'll go ahead and finish this. What the system will do is return us to the sidebar. It'll automatically set the starting year to the one we just finished. Um, oh, actually, tell you what, I, I'm going to have to finish this. I forgot about that. Uh, so what I'm going to do I'm going to only select the fields that I have setbacks for um, because the system insists that you finish. In other words, we don't wanna leave things undone because it's often uh, a problem because users forget what is undone. And so instead we, we make sure they finish it and now we're finished because we actually have setback maps for all three of these uh, farms. And now we have the opportunity to download the map book that we talked about because we have a finished survey. Now notice, we now have three setback maps. Uh, we have not downloaded the setback PDF yet, so we have the red X. If, uh, if I was doing something else and wanted a shortcut, I would just hit go and the system would automatically make all the selections. All I have to do at this point is click download. And there we go. We've got our uh, application setback or manure application setback map book. It's got the uh, producer's name on it, the planner's name on the cover page. Here are all the setback maps followed by the nicknames that we gave them. And of course, here is our attempt at providing uh, beautiful manure setback maps, along with an interpretation of all the features, the setback distances, the area, uh, and then we also provide field level uh, summary data. The spreadable acres value is what needs to be entered into MMP. And so now I've got the total field boundary area and the portion of that field boundary that can be uh, manure applied. And that would be, uh, at this point, it would be manually entered into MMP. All right, let me show you one more use case that I alluded to. Let's go, let's um, actually, if we click on add, add setback map, it's gonna give us a shortcut to step three. And what we can do now, let's say we've got, we've defined our worst case, the frozen broadcast case. And now I wanna define the best case. So the farmer can see the contrast between the two. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the Griffith farm, which is the same farm that we have up here and click add setback map. And on this in this case, I'm gonna use injected application and I'm going to uh, apply them to uh, thawed ground. So now we can see that our spreadable area has increased to 100 and almost 118 uh, acres uh, will probably have a more dramatic effect um, with uh, the Mosier farm, but you get the idea. You can basically create scenarios. The TSP can decide what they want to uh, suggest and the grower can easily see the impact. 
So here our spreadable acres uh, increased quite a bit as a percentage, almost, almost 9%. So there you go. That's, that's an overview of the uh, manure setback uh, capability here that, again, is a companion to MMP. Uh, let me pause for questions and see if anybody has. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you mentioned that you can uh, upload shapefiles of fields from other programs. Can you upload other information that's available in shapefiles, such as your NHD records that you don't have to hand mm -hmm. a lot of streams, or, or if your county health department has, you know, a shapefile location of wells, could you upload that? And then that way you don't have to manually place where all of these things are? Yeah, let me repeat that question for our online audience. Um, in general, the question is, can features be uploaded uh, from other sources, whether it be a shape file from a county office or fetched from USGS or NAS or you know, other government sources? And the answer is that's a, absolutely the right way to think about it. <laughs> um, at this point, it's only a question of engineering uh, hours and priority, but uh, we'd, we'd love to take it there uh, in the future. So the question is, or the answer is yes, it can be done. It, it probably will be done at some point, but I, I can't speak to the timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, the distance to water in MMP, mm -hmm. is that auto calculated based no. on drone screens? No, and actually, so the question is, is the distance to water automatically calculated? And the answer there is, possibly more complex than you might guess because um, what is required, so what you're actually looking for is the flow path. It's not just the, you know, as the crow flies from the edge of the field to the stream, that would actually be relatively simple. But what we need is a high resolution digital elevation model so that we can, we can actually calculate flow path based on high, high res topography. And we've asked the government for that. There is a one meter DEM available, not available, but it's available for internal use. Um, and uh, we're anxious for that to change so that we can run that calculation precisely uh, for the user. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, a six inch DEM would be phenomenal. Um, well, then we should talk. That's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, we definitely should talk about that. So the question is, what if there was a six-inch dim? And uh, of course, that would be that would be really intense. Actually, maybe overkill. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be pretty difficult to process. But uh, but yeah, definitely worth talking about for sure. Because it could be, you can always reduce resolution in spatial data. Um, it's hard to increase it. Obviously, very expensive to do that. Great questions and comments. What else? Anything else? Oh yeah. So the question is: Is it is it? So the question is: Is it cloud-based or or a desktop application? I th I think um, MMP is a desktop application that you download and run on your local machine. Everything I just showed you is running in the the Amazon Web Services cloud, and so uh, all of you know all of those uh, sort of security implications are in place and um, many, many layers of security. And actually cloud-based applications are far more secure than, uh, than any desktop application. So, which is a little bit of a misunderstanding, I think among a lot of farmers, but, um, but it's true. Yeah, Terry. Within this system, on the TSP, I'm obviously I'm doing all over and the log into my farms, correct? So how do I, you know, if I as a TSP want to share this with my with my producer that I'm developing a plan for. Right. Can I share that? How do I, yes. How do I share access? Terry, so Terry just asked, if I'm a TSP, how do I uh, feed this data to my producer? Which, which implies that I skipped one of the most important uh, steps along the way. <laughs> so apologies. Let me point out, I am logged in as Nutrient Advisor or, or a TSP, a CCA, whoever. Uh, could be, you know, extension person. I'm logged in as a nutrient advisor. I'm safe linking to dairy producer over here. So this is where I decide who I'm entering data for. And I'm actually entering data on their behalf. So everything I just did, dairy producer can log in and do him or herself. And they can, they receive the benefit of everything I just did for them. So 
were built from the ground up to facilitate that collaborative connection between advisors and producers um, because we want to facilitate a conversation, not create silos of data that, that can't change hands easily. The, the question about features got me thinking about something else. You actually took that in a direction that, I, um, that makes sense, but the direction I thought you might be going in is fetching field level data from other cloud-based applications, which, which is something we could uh, talk more about. Um, for example, if you click on add fields and you say, yes, you use a farm management system, the user could connect to Climate Field View or their John Deere Operations Center account. And so I can, I'll go ahead and do that. We'll just let this run just for fun because um, you'll see a number of alerts come um, and it's, it's kind of it's neat. Um, so, so we just clicked on connect. We can set basically permissions for what my farm should fetch out of my John Deere account. And I want them to grab my field boundaries, my as planted maps and my, uh, my yield maps. And then I'll just save that. Keep right clicking accidentally, there we go. So we have, this is an account with more than a hundred field boundaries, a, a huge amount of data. Um, it, it's a little unusual, but you have to, you actually have to click cancel here. So, so now my farms is fetching the John Deere data. So what, by the way, what happened there? We, we skipped a step because I use LastPass. So my, my password got entered automatically. I expect that. Um, but normally you would have to enter your username and your password, and then you have to click confirm that MyFarms has permission to do this. Um, so now what you're seeing is MyFarms fetching data out of a John Deere account that is our company account. It's just a, a test account we have. Um, so in that amount of time, we just finished grabbing the field boundaries. That's the first thing we have to do. Now we're grabbing the planting map data from Deere. But while that's happening, in parallel, we can click on finish. And like I said, this is a massive data set. Um, it'll, it'll take a bit. There we go. So all these field boundaries just came in from deer. <laughs> I said, I mean, that's that's how easy this can be when it's done. Uh, you know, when when these types of technologies are used. Um, go. Did you have a question? Or Right. So the question is, does the farmer have to give us his credentials, um, his login credentials, which would be a security risk, of course, for the farmer? And, and the answer is no, he doesn't have to, but he can if he wants to. So think of it this way. I'm, I'm logged in as nutrient advisor. I'm his advisor. If the farmer doesn't want to take the time to make this connection, I can make it for him if he's willing to give me his username and password. Now, if I were that farmer, I'd say, I'm happy to log in. I'll do that myself. And I'll let you know when it's finished. And if the farmer wants to do that for himself, he can and he should. But a lot of farmers aren't there yet. So we want to empower advisors to help them along the way. And so in this case, as Nutrient Advisor, I made the connection for dairy producer. So the the John Deere connection lives with dairy producer, not with Nutrient Advisor. But Nutrient Advisor did the work because the farmer didn't want to or didn't know how to or wasn't comfortable or whatever. Yes. Just quickly, um, so I just want to get back to what you were talking about, about the capabilities of being able to uh, do setbacks from waterways because mm -hmm. in Michigan we have a lot of water. That is like the number one yeah. concern that we want to so if, if I'm hand entering, this is the location of a stream, mm -hmm. it can still tell me here's your required setback from the waterway or not. Oh, yes. Okay. So the question is, if you manually enter a stream as a feature, can the system tell you what the setback must be? And the answer is yes. Um, it just can't automatically upload to the NHB. There's a stream here. That's right. That's right. We're, we're not using map data to automatically say, hey, there's a stream there. Um, and that's that's just a function of 
the amount of time we've had so far and some budgetary questions. So we decided to create one drawing tool set that handles every feature. And then what we'll do is we'll probably watch the data and see which features are most common and then start automating those. So we're crowdsourcing data about which features are most commonly used. And then we can say, okay, well, if we can handle 30% of the feature creation process by implementing this one map connection, then let's do that. And so a year from now, I can easily see us working with the government to make those those decisions. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the question or the comment is, right now streams are being handled as a line, and of course streams have width; they're not lines. Um, and the question is, what if we could actually detect the edges of the stream? Would that would that improve the situation? And and the answer is yes. I think you might be getting into a little bit of fine tuning that is above and beyond um, what's needed, but. What is it all up to the application to follow that? Does it matter in a plan? It's a it's a fair point, and maybe that's the role for a six inch dam. Um, well, you'd need actually you would need uh, you could do that a variety of ways actually because it's pretty easy to detect water from space. Um, so yeah, it's a good idea. I mean. It's again. It's sort of in the fine tuning domain. I think there are there are things that are so uh, uh, just challenging for the user that we'd want to. That, that, but we're always open to refinement. I mean, it could be a decade from now before we do that. But we it, at that point it would make sense because that's the next logical thing to tackle to move things forward. Yeah. the way you'd have to handle it, you'd actually probably have to, and it depends, every state's different. And the feature has a geometry type associated with it in the database. So that's a policy decision. We don't change policy. We, we just find the quickest and easiest way to implement the policy that is current. And so the, the National Manure Setback Database is what everything is driven by. And right now streams are lines in, in every case that I've seen. Now a state could say a stream is a polygon. And their users then would have to draw a polygon around the stream, um, but that would be a policy change that a state would have to make and then we would implement it. So I just wanna be clear, we are not policy makers. We, we're just there to help find the quickest and easiest way to implement the policy that, that is current. Yes. So um, this idea of earthly there's when you're trying to work on a plan for a farmer that is less tax staff, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the question is, what if a farmer doesn't use email? and his wife sets his VCR for him to record stuff. Um, absolutely, that's a very common case. We have a lot of farmers like that too. And in my farms, you don't have to enter an email address to have an account. You have to have an email address to log into your account, but we, we call that an unauthenticated account. And so Nutrient Advisor can create an account for dairy producer that is not authenticated meaning they can organize the data under the farmer, but the farmer doesn't have to log in to do anything. So if, if the nutrient advisor just wanted to use the, the producer account to organize it relative to other clients and keep sort of keep everything segmented the way it should be, then he can sit down, safe link to a dairy producer and have a conversation about it in person. That's, that's exactly why it's built that way. So yeah, we, we ran into that very early on and uh, we, we fully understand that some farmers are never gonna Log into email. Uh huh. Go ahead, Terry. So, what's the timeline for this mapping ability? Number one and number two. I know we're about to make it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think number two, I think we did a CNFPs for Ohio. I think they're wanting soils map. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what is the timeline for rolling this out to TSPs? And then secondly, when will soil type maps be added to the PDF map book? Um, the answer to the first question is, well, this everything I just showed you is in production. So, so this is out. It's ready. Um, it's ready for beta testing, I would say. I, I want to go through, a, give, a, give it a couple weeks of having a few people interact with it, give us their feedback, uh, make sure we didn't miss anything obvious uh, or even less than obvious. Um, and I also want to use that time to generate uh, video content, so training materials so that we can walk people through exactly what to do because we want that first experience to be really positive. So while the tool is pretty much ready for use in its current state. Um, we want to make sure that from a support and training point of view, everything, you know, other things are in place. So now that the tool exists, we can start doing video capture and walkthroughs of these features and the next few weeks have, you know, have some of that content ready to go as well uh, in parallel with some beta testing that will happen, you know, here in the near term. Regarding the soil type maps, um, We are working through um, some some additional agreements that will make that possible, and uh, we're we're ready to go on that. Um, we just need to get some other things, some 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 T's crossed and I's dotted, and so forth, and then we'll we'll be good to go on that sort of next. This is what we consider the minimum viable product, and that's how we think about it. We don't want to wait until it's perfect. In fact, I have a slide or two on this. Uh, I heard I heard a few things mentioned throughout the course of the uh, um, the week, and I just thought I don't know if this is going to be helpful to anyone in this room, but I just wanted to share a little bit about how we think about it. Um, I've heard some people say we didn't want to show farmers our thing because we weren't sure it was ready, um, and yeah, yes. That's okay. You know what? Let's just leave it right there. Okay. Get the animation. We're fine. Oh, sorry. It's still. All right. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. But just at least when it comes to software development, and I also think people abuse the term agile software development. They think that means you build something and then figure out what you really need and then rebuild it. But we do not think about that because that's an incredibly expensive way. To, to handle it. So we, we want to expose our ideas early and often. As early as like, as soon as we have an idea, we'll share it and try to refine it. But then I think this is really key that most people find it really difficult to respond to ideas, but they can immediately respond to a picture when it comes to software, at least. So if you can lay out the idea on a screen and get people to respond to it, we, we can quickly evolve ideas forward without writing a single line of code. It's all done in, you know, in, uh, in PowerPoint or whatever makes sense. So we also wanna think about the problem from multiple points of view, not just from the farmer's point of view, but from the TSP, the administrator who has to sort of track progress overall. And then, you know, we try to think of our own ideas as just a catalyst for finding better ones. They're not the right idea. They're just the idea that hopefully spurs someone else who knows more to, to build on it and, and improve what we've, what we've thought of. Um, we then like to get started. And, uh, you know, and although it becomes increasingly difficult to respond to design input. So for those of us that might be thinking about building a solution, be detailed in the beginning. It's much cheaper that way. Um, but even if people think of new things later, uh, we still want to be very open to that uh, indefinitely because maybe we can incorporate it in a future release. Um, you know, and then we want to focus on making life better, not just not achieving perfection. So this is this is an incomplete solution based on our own design. There are two more things that we want to do and that we will do. Um, we want to produce an MMP project file that you can basically export from MyFarms. This is why downloads is plural. It's not just one, it's, it's going to be three. Um, you're going to be able to push a button, export a project file, and then import it to MMP. And that is going to contain all of this data. So it'll be operation contact name, physical and email address, starting year and month, all of this will be pre-populated in MMP because, again, one of our goals is to eliminate or you know, minimize duplicate data entry. 
And so if you're just getting started with a new CNMP, you can set all of this up in my farms and then push a button and import all of this data into MMP. That'll be our second download. And then our third download will be setback map images because we know that not everyone uses MMP, but everybody wants beautiful manure setback maps, right? Everybody. So uh, whether you're using a state specific application or whatever, you can export the images and then just copy and paste them into the CNMP document. Uh, so those are, that's the, the, the third download. And then of course, for MMP itself, we have a massive list of ideas for improving and streamlining that process. So uh, look for more on that, you know, in a year. Ah, can the setback maps be downloaded as a prescription map and imported to a variable rate uh, controller? And uh, the answer is, well, we have a mock-up for that. I can show you where in our system it will live. So this is what a, what a design mock-up looks like. Um, so here we've got our setback map selected. You can select everything you want and then hit download. And those shape files would be downloaded so you can bring them into the, the controller. Um, this is probably after we get the other two downloads built out and finished. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That, that's a logical you know, next iteration on, on this theme. So then, so just so everyone's clear, um, um, everyone probably already knows this, but just in case, that means that the variable rate controller would automatically turn the manure spreader off when it enters this red zone. Red. And um, obviously that's, that's a much more convenient way for the producer to know for sure what he's supposed to do and, and his equipment will do it for him basically. So um, all of that will be available on the data page under download maps. And then you would just set the setback map filter and then you could download everything. So we, we already have this, this tool built. We just need to add support for the setback maps uh, in the future. Right now you can download yield maps as planted maps, uh, field boundaries, soil type maps. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, actually, that's that's a great idea, and that's that's what was I think uh, discussed a little bit earlier. Um, so, Mark, I think your question is for the features that are currently specified to be lines by the National Manure Setback Database. Could we change those into polygons so you can give them area, which is truer to uh, reality? Is that a fair summary, or did you have something else in mind, Mark? Mark, feel free to unmute if you'd like and. Talk to us. Okay, he said yes. So yes. So the question is, can we? And the answer is, technologically we could, but from a policy point of view, uh, the policy we're doing what the policy states, and so we could try to persuade the policymakers. And we do, we do have those conversations from time to time. So occasionally we share thoughts on how to refine the policy, um, but we are not the policymakers. Uh, just to be clear. So, um, so yeah. Does that help, Mark? Okay. You don't. You don't draw the line at the center line. You draw it on the top bank. Well, the Mississippi River doesn't flow through many fields. Usually you're farming on one side or the other. And so you can specify that you're up against a water body, but that's not a river. So in that case, I think we're covered. 
and you don't usually farm through the Mississippi. I got farmed on both sides. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's let's talk about that. So actually, that's that's a better way to handle it. So, okay, yes, we actually do have a way to handle this. Um, thank you, Mary. I didn't think of this. Let me uh, let me go, and uh, we're going to add setback maps. And let's handle, I think it was Mosier. So the National Winter Setback Database specifies the minimum setback, but the user can increase the setback to any value. Well, maybe up to a thousand. I, I think we probably have an upper limit. Um, oh, sorry, this is the wrong. So let's go here, I think. No, that's not the one. Okay, so there's our intermittent stream. It's calling for a setback of 35 feet. If the stream was 10 feet wide and you wanted to go to the center line, then you'd add five feet. So go ahead and just set that to 40. And there, now we've we've handled the width of the stream just by, just by adding the setback distance. So yeah, much better answer. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Right. So yeah. So the, the observation is that MMP um, MMP actually only allows a plan record to be in, in one state. And so if you straddle a state boundary and you farm in Ohio and Indiana, for example, then, and we actually built this to match that constraint. It's not our preference, but MMP is, is constrained that way. So in our system, you can only associate fields with the same setback map survey that share the same, the same state. So if I had field boundaries in Ohio and Indiana, but my plan is for Ohio, I would be prevented from selecting the Indiana fields. And that way, when we dump the data to MMP, um, that project file will not cause an error in MMP, which it would if, if we had states from multiple fields. And that way, uh, all of you know, the, the soil types are filtered by state. Um, so this is MMP. And on the general tab is where the state is specified. And so the soil types on the assess or on the uh, on the fields tab are filtered by the state, and so we we have to separate field boundaries by state, and that's separate to our side as well. Chris, this is Mark out here. Hi, Mark. So one other question on the the shape files for the fields, um, you've got the overall map, but. Um, you can, can you, or can you not import, say, uh, files from FSA uh, mm -hmm. field records and, or say, for instance, you're, you know, you're just dealing with uh, XYZ co-op and they've already, uh, you know, mapped all the edge of fields Yes. to yeah. lay that in there. So for the folks in the room here, Mark's comment is, can shapefiles be exported from government systems like FSA um, or from the ag retailer? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so for example, a farmer could log into his farmers.gov account if he has EAuth2 access and download his field boundaries as shapefiles. He could do that today. Or he could call his NRCS field agent who could log into conservation desktop and pull down all of his field boundaries as shape files from there. Or he could call his ag retailer and ask them to export their data, his data as in shape file format and then upload it to my farm. So uh, as far as we know, all of those work streams uh, are supported. Um, maybe just while we're here, uh, you'll notice here that we've finished importing the John Deere yield map data. 
So let's track file status. So what this what this is doing, and it may already be finished. Oh, and actually, so the um, the field boundaries that we imported, I never actually saved them because I didn't want to uh, pollute this whole experience. So now that we're pretty much finished with the experience, I'll go ahead and save these. And when I say pollute, I mean we have a lot of a bunch of data, and I'd have to sort through it every time we want to talk about a field. Um, but we'll go ahead and do that because then we can start processing the yield map data. And um, I'll just show you one of the outputs uh, for that. Let's see. So here's what we can do with the data that comes out of DEER. Uh, we can generate a field map summary report. And uh, here's a summary of all the data that from all the fields that are included in the report. And the user decides which fields are included and what sections in this report get generated. So that's very dynamic and very simple. It's just a wizard that walks them through the process. Um, so we're gonna look at some as planted data, some yield data, a yield by planting rate summary and a yield by product summary. And so here's the, the geospatial components for a single uh, field called Terhune. Here's my yield map, my as planted map, and then we cross the two to get yield by planting rate, yield by product, et cetera. So the goal is to you know, create a few uses for the data. Um, nutrient management is one of them, but this will answer another set of questions for growers that have their own, um, you know, their own questions. Anything else? This kind of information space cloud, it's, it's dumping information and data into the existing MMP program. Maybe, maybe you don't know what kind of timelines MMP on as far as you know, Is there a plan to take that up to the cloud? Is everything that, that you're showing here, I'm, I'm using this as an application to develop information into the MMP. Right. Develop a PDF that I can merge with my final document. Yeah, but this this truly is just a different way to put out information in the MMP. That's right. Is there a rebuild of MMP on the drawing board? Is that planned at this point? So, is there a plan to basically rebuild MMP for the cloud? And and the answer is yes. There is. Um, it will be a phased approach. So uh, there'll be. You know, priority states that we focus on, and then uh, add add additional support over time. Um, and uh, yeah, so the timeline we won't talk about for now, but uh, but yeah, we're we're early days on that. But um, but we do have a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of ideas. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Let's um, say farm has both, you know, climate, you'll do whatever, and as well as my data. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be able to enter it from both of those sources, even if they're using a field when it comes to deer? Is that going to be the system? Or? Yeah. So the question is, what if a grower uses both deer and field view, and they make both of these connections? Now, yes, they can do that. But they'll have to be very careful because if they have their field boundaries in both systems, they're going to end up with duplicates in my farms. So what we need and the way our system works. So, so the, the reason, um, I don't know if you noticed earlier, and I didn't point this out, but when I uh, save those field boundaries, you have an option to hide them in my farms. So you can, you can have the connection, but you can choose which fields you want to see in your MyFarms experience just by clicking a, a negative sign. And so what you'd have to do is you, if you import all your field boundaries from Deer and then you make your field view connection, before you click save, like I did, you'd go through the list and say, okay, I don't want this one, this one, this one, this one, because it already came in from Deer. And um, 
Otherwise, you'll have chaos. Uh, you, you know, it's very difficult to live with duplicate field boundaries because you don't know which data is where and where to put it. It's, it's a very bad situation. You'd almost want to start over. If, if you accidentally save duplicate field boundaries from two systems, um, but then but then the geospatial data, the, the yield map data can still come across and we geo match every point in the yield map data set. So every point is judged for which boundary it falls within. So we don't need a connection to the field boundary from the secondary system. Um, we can still fetch the yield or as planted data. And then we just test every point to see which boundary it falls within. And that's all part of the, it's a probably a 10 step process that our system goes through automatically to actually generate a map without any user intervention. Great questions. This is really good. Here's what I was talking about, that multi-step process. So here's one that's at uh, mapping queued. Um, so what that means is that this point set is it's next in line or it's in a line to get uh, to get the map generated. And so um, this is what's kind of fun to watch because these will all update as you watch them and you kind of track their progress. These, we found that there are no boundaries in our system that match the data set. And so you won't see the data, but if you were to create a boundary that matches the that data set, then we would generate the map for you automatically. That's a trigger. Okay, what else? Do you have something else, Terry? No? no. Okay. Yes. What's the capability to export this information to other programs? So, I don't know, if I'm participating in field to market or something mm. like that, I want to be able to take the data that I've entered through MMP and through, you know, and through the through the MyFarms mapper, and I want to be able to say, all right, this is, you know, this is what I've done for my mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, can we can we pass this data to third party um, uh, environmental outcomes initiatives like Field to Market? So here is the result of the field print platform for this field. So it's a great question, actually, because this was our this was sort of our foray into sustainability. We were doing non-GMO corn traceability. We were digitizing that for a, a large company and they said, let's pass all that data to field to market and, and satisfy our Coca-Cola and PepsiCo and Unilever and General Mills requirements. And so we started doing that about five years ago, I think. And then, um, so yeah, a lot of our, a lot of our clients um, leverage that connection. Um, so yes, all the data, um, and the data is built to be modular. So once you create your nutrient plan, you could use it in your NMP, your CNMP, or in your field print analysis. And it's the exact same form. We just launch it from different places. We also, you'll notice in this case, we have uh, 10 buttons along the top. In the MMP downloads case, I think we have five. So they're, they're custom configured solutions that add or subtract depending on what the partner needs. Um, to be effective. We, we think less is more. <laughs> we don't want to overwhelm the user. And that's also why the navigation assistant is so important to walk the user through the process because you can do so many different things. People get lost. Um, so we try to be really clear about where you're at and what's next toward a destination. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's a feature that you could basically design for fields or story storage, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so Design stuff like that. And so the NM Tractor has a lagoon and um, a designing a design tool. And the answer is no, we're not planning to build that uh, anytime soon. Um, now I will say MMP requires certain information about the storage facility, of course. And so that would be on the roadmap for the MMP build. Um, I haven't heard our, our stakeholders say much yet about, uh, so the go-to tool for design tends to be the animal waste management application, AWM. Um, and I haven't heard anyone indicate that we need to, or we should bring that functionality into our workflow, um, but that can change. And so, um, actually I'm gonna, write, I'm gonna write your question down and some of the right people are already on the line. So.
Good question. Anything else? Yes. So you mentioned that, uh, this, that this member is incorporating uh, state regulatory, you said state regulatory standards or state NRCS standards for mm -hmm. Form 90. Yes. I, I want to clarify, is this incorporating, for instance, each state's particular, you know, if, you know, if you're a farm with this kind of permit, here's your setback. And, you know, and if you've got this different kind of permit, here's your setback. And, you know, it's for the state agency versus NRCS versus, you know, your standard 590 program. What, like, what's the, like, what all information is incorporated into yeah. the capability of establishing setbacks for different things? Sure thing. So, um, actually, let me go back to the previous step. There's something I, I kind of glossed over. Um, I should have called out. When you add these features, you're choosing what standard you're complying with. And so CAFO would be an Ohio state specific standard. And then there's the NRCS standard. So every state has the NRCS standard. Some have their own standard as well. And there might even be a, a third. So, so the features are tied to a standard and then the setbacks are tied to the feature. It's actually the feature and the application criteria. So each state has their own they have the option to create their own standard, their own uh, list of features under these five categories. The categories are standardized. Um, these five things are shared, oh, whoops, are shared across the states. But you can basically decide what features fall under these categories um, at the state level. And you can do that for the, um, and then the features, of course. So, so when I define a feature, all of this has been specified. So we know that you're creating a feature under the NRC standard. So we would reference that standard for the setback distance. And then if the state had their own standard. Uh, yeah. So then if you had a, a, a state standard, we would filter this list by that, uh, by that list. Yes. The, do we have the data for all states? And the answer is no. Uh, in the National Manure Setback Database, I believe there are 37 states represented. That's sort of how far the team got. And this was probably six or seven years ago. Um, right, no. Um, so if there are new setbacks, then you can contact our team and we'll work with you to get them updated. Um, we're just starting with the, the latest version of the National Manure Setback Database, which actually ships with MMP. And it's also, uh, NM Tracker was built on top of the same database. So, um, and so that's what we're, that's what we're showing here as well. Yes. Oh, I think somebody is talking online. If you could mute your microphone. <laughs> uh, so the question is data privacy. How, you know, who all has access to the data and um, what, what should the farmer be aware of, I guess, about. Um, so for this application, the TSP, of course, would have access to any data that they were a part of creating. Um, and it's, you know, the farmer gets to decide who can connect to his data. So um, there's, you know, at this point, I would say your question becomes uh, more germane when it comes to uh, moving MMP to the cloud. Um, our general policy is that the farmer owns his or her data. They can delete it if they want to. If they ask us to, to remove their account, we will. Um, we have a very simple and clear uh, privacy policy, which logged in users can reference any time from any of these, any of these dialogues. Um, so as you can see here, you own your data. Um, we also are clear that we never sell data. Uh, we have no third party investors. So we have no one else to satisfy. We're farmers first. 
And so we're treating others the way we'd want to be treated. And so um, monetizing data is not part of our business model. And it, it hasn't been for a decade. And it won't be for another three decades, probably. So... To do this, it won't cost anything to the farmer. So, so yeah, these tools are going to be freely available. The what I just showed you is going to be freely available, mm -hmm. just like MMP. All right. Um, I don't know if anyone's if anyone wants to leave, just feel free. Don't. <laughs> I'm going to hang out as long as people are here and, and you want to talk, I'm happy to do that, but no one should feel uh, obligated. Uh, please feel free to do whatever you, you wish. Ah, how to register? Yes. Okay. Yep. Let me, um, I seem to be, here we go, finally. Okay, um, sure thing. Let's, uh, let's show you the sort of the administrative side of things. So everything I've just shown you is how a TSP would enter data for a grower and it's sort of grower facing. So we, we call it the grower application, but then we have what's called the portal. And the portal is where, uh, uh, certain users with privilege have the ability to do things that, that farmers uh, can't do. So, for example, being able to register accounts is an administrative privilege or being able to reset passwords on behalf of users or deciding who farmers report to in the system. Everything is filtered by the reports to structure. So if I'm a TSP and I log in, I only see the farmers who report to me in the system. And so uh, users through this tool can set those relationships, whereas not everyone should have the right to set those relationships, of course. If I'm a competing TSP, I might want to take all your growers away, and that obviously would create mayhem. So um, so this is how one registers with my farms. You just enter in a valid email address, a first and last name. Uh, the rest is optional. The username will actually be automatically generated if uh, you don't enter one based on your first name and last name. And if John Smith already exists, it'll give you a number at the end. So John Smith 14. Um, so you can either specify a username or you can uh, choose not to. Um, you can enter the address information. The mobile number is nice to have for support purposes. If they call us and we need to give them a call back, we can do that. So then once you fill out this form, All right, so <laughs> that user already exists. Um, so if the user already exists, then you can send them an email and invite them to let you connect to them too. So we look at email address and apparently fake at email is already a, a grower in our system. Uh, so let's try something a little more interesting. Pretty sure that's unique. Um, okay, so now my data is complete. See how the arrow just advanced? So our data is complete. What, what that means is that we're not, it doesn't mean we're finished entering data. It means that you've entered enough data to authenticate the account. And so now you have a new option. Before the data was complete, we only had one option. We could register the user. So this gets back to that conversation we had earlier about not all farmers have email addresses. And so if, if you don't have an email address, a first name, or a last name, if you're missing a first name, you don't have to enter it but you have to register the account and you can safe link to that user, but they can't log in. So if you want an account, you would have to enter everything. And so now because data is complete, I have the option to either just register them or I can register and authenticate them. And if I do that, then we're gonna fire an email off to this address and we're gonna say, hey, you've been invited to join my farms, click here and we'll, you can set up your password. And it's impossible for anyone else to ever know their password because we salt and hash it. So even our developers can't, can't see the passwords, it's possible. So then, um, yeah. So that's how you register a new user, yeah. So related to that, then suppose a farm changes who their TSP provider is. 
Mm -hmm. Is there a way to think DSPs are like yes. DSPs are using my farms? Yeah. So on the users page, then this is where qualified administrators can manage that relationship. Now, because I'm logged in as nutrient advisor, that fake producer is gonna is gonna report to me automatically. So I may not have access to this page, but I still want my growers reporting to me. And so that relationship is set automatically, but an administrator can then change it. So here we have fake producer reporting to me, nutrient advisor. But if, if that TSP relationship changes, then it's possible to update who, who that user reports to. Uh, it, it will be. Certainly our support team can do any of this. We're happy to administer these types of uh, solutions, but we also would typically have somebody on the on the client side who also has access and power to do these things. Yes, right. Someone with NRCS, definitely. Uh, I, that's a decision that the MMP team will make together. That's not that's not my choice. It's a it'll be a team discussion and decision. Um, so. Fair question, just I, we're not there yet. No, they don't have to. So the question is, can the farmer unlink their account uh, to a TSP or from a TSP? Um, they would have to contact us to do that, but we would, we would be happy to do it for them. Yeah. TSP never gets played right. Right. But if the TSP falls well, short, right? I mean, one star review. Let's let's move on. Um, That'll be a part of the review process, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Given well, in, from the other perspective, too, can a TSP say, you know, I'm dropping this person as a client. I no longer want their account information. Right. I'm all responsible for this mess at all. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to be associated with this CNMP. Yeah. Yeah, so if you if you do remove the account, uh, it doesn't delete the account, it just breaks the relationship to to this entity and you know, in this case NRCS. Um, but the account still exists, the farmer can still log in and do whatever they want to. It wouldn't be deleted unless they contact us and request that. And NRCS see everything. The the TSP can and one or two administrators probably will have view all access for support purposes. The reason for that is because TSPs will call with questions and wonder why isn't this grower in my safe link dropdown or whatever. And someone needs to be ready and available and able to answer those types of questions. So it's not that we're aggregating data and dumping it or storing it somewhere. It's just for administrative purposes. Someone needs to be able to fix things, you know, along the way. I have to say, this has been a much richer and lengthier conversation than I was expecting. So I appreciate everyone staying, staying around and asking such great questions. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else from the online community that or audience that wants to weigh in or not, but um, again, no one should feel pressured to stay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hey, Chris, this is Eric Schwab. Yes, hey, Eric. Wow. Yeah. How are you doing? Oh, um, great. In this first release, is it just going to be the map products? Yes. Okay, and then the yep. MMP file will come later. What about the soils maps? Will that be a possibility? Or I think you covered that, and that's to come. Yeah, yet, right. Sure thing. Yeah. So the question is, what's what's now versus later? And um, let me let me go back to a couple of slides where we we talked about kind of where we're at and what's coming. Um, here it is. So what we've done so far. Eric, and, and it could be that you weren't here from the beginning, which is totally fine. Um, what we've covered so far is being able to map features, being able to look up setback distances automatically, producing images that comply with government regulation, and then producing a PDF that, um, do I have one of these? 
Yep, here it is. So here's the PDF output. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what the setback map looks like at this point. Our thought is that if you need an image, worst case, you can just snip this image and drop it into Word for your CNMP. So there's kind of a workaround for that piece. Um, but the MMP project file um, is, uh, is forthcoming at this point. And it, um, it was just a question of, of, you know, a little bit of funding question, a little bit of priority question. So that's, that's where we're at with the minimum viable product. And then we'll be adding, I think, additional support in the future. Does that answer your question, Eric? Oh, and then soil, soil right now. So uh, definitely on the radar. Um, again, we're gonna get through a little bit of paperwork and then I think we'll be able to, to get back at adding that support as well. We certainly, we wanted to release something that moves the needle, even though we know that it's, um, it's not a 100% solution. We're, we're trying to hopefully make, uh, make a few lives better anyway in the meantime. So uh, does, that, does that help or do you have any other questions about that? No, that, that helps out. I was just you know, figuring out what, what the first step was going to be. So, okay. Yep. I appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. And thanks for all of your input and ideas along the way, by the way. So really appreciate yeah. that. I think. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, is there a capability to include in the, in the output of this the latitude, longitude of the field location? Yes. Yes. Actually. Thing our state's asking for is okay. They no longer want a street address. They want a latitude longitude. Well, let me show you the mock-up because what I'm showing you right now is uh, what's in production. But let me show you the mock-up for the the complete solution. So this was the original mock-up that sort of, you know, we use this to get a lot of input and ideas from a lot of different parties. And we, we've worked on this for probably, you know, a couple of months actually um, to let those ideas simmer. And then this is what kind of drove our development process to, to automate it. So here you can see, we're gonna have a, a whole section dedicated to soil type maps, one per farm. And then um, here is a bird's eye view of all fields in the plan. This We've not implemented this yet, but below this image are the geospatial coordinates for every field. So you get the long lat sort of centroid of each field. And um, so yeah, absolutely great idea. And it's, we're just not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, Uh, so the question is, what if a farmer already has an account with my farms? Um, I think your question is, are they starting from scratch from a data point of view or not? And the answer is definitely not. Um, what, um, what will happen is this, we call it the dashboard. Um, this dashboard will contain all of the experiences. We call this an experience. Um, so like I showed you, for example, I think the ADM experience uh, earlier. So that has their logo and their tools. The farmer gets to choose which experiences, which experience that they're connected to that they actually will experience. And so this doesn't, this dashboard doesn't appear until the grower is connected to at least two experiences, because until then they're just, they have one, and so there's no reason. But once they have a second experience, this dashboard would appear and they would choose which one they're interacting with. So maybe they're connected to Cargill and they're, they've got the field print analysis data and they've got 150 field boundaries and all their nutrient management plans. Um, to get to the setback mapping tool, they would just toggle, switch over to the NRCS experience. Now they see all of these tabs in the browser. So now they get MMP and they get all the field boundaries are present. It's their data. So the experience kind of rallies around their data without having them re-enter anything. That's, that is like core actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, we don't have CSV support for yield data. 
Um, we have, what's that? They can create a management zone map in shapefile format. And that's typically a function of multiple years of yield data. Um, so yes, you could upload a productivity management zone map as a shapefile, um, but you, you can also upload raw yield data, yield or as planted or as, uh, well, yield and as planted data at the moment. So if you go to data, then you click add maps, and then you wanna upload it. Then you can say, I wanna upload my raw yield data. And then you just filter the, the, the uh, format by the, the product, and then you click upload. So this is if you don't have your data up in the Deer Cloud or the Field View Cloud, and you're using SMS or you know, you're know you using thumb drives to move data between the tractor cab and, and uh, a computer, then you can just upload them from your hard drive locally, and then we'll convert them. And from that point forward, the whole automated process that I, I we looked at briefly uh, just happens for the user. And then they can confirm the product if they want to, but they don't have to, and they get the maps within a few minutes. So that's the other pathway for getting geospatial data in, into my farm. I don't know if you'd wanna see uh, some, I could, for example, um, We actually just we just put a lot of work into these uh, over the past six months or so. So here's what uh, an as planted map. Now this actually might be of interest to you in particular because of your your thoughts about how uh, software manufacturers. Or, or makes um, adjust data without talking much about it. This is what the actual log file says about this field. But if you look at it in a different platform, and I, I won't mention the platform for now, they auto correct this zip, zip lining feature. What happened is the user failed to configure the display to account for the lag um, in changing their, their application rates. And so when this particular company sees this, they auto adjust it to smooth out the lines instead of displaying what actually happened. And we're, we're convinced of that at this point because uh, we actually contacted them to see, because we can see it's different in their system. We've, we've loaded the same map into their application and they don't show these, these zip line features. So anyway, that's an example of an as planted map. Here's, uh, here's an example of a yield map. Um, this is a histogram of uh, the bins that the yield data falls within. So 13.7% of the 144 bushels per acre, et cetera. Um, so that's what the bar is representing. Um, so this is, I think, the example I was showing earlier about if you wanted to download a PDF summary of this, then you would just find the field that has the data. You can decide what sections are in the report. You could just dump your field boundaries, but you could also dump your planting and yield map data. Uh, and then if you if you include yield and, and a planting map, then you can start to cross those maps to run the analysis and then click process. And it'll actually trigger an email uh, to me. So it'll say, hey, we're working on this for you. Check your email in a few minutes. And uh, that way the user isn't held hostage while this work happens. Uh, they can just keep moving with whatever, whatever they want to do and then check their email at their convenience. That actually just, that just went out last Friday, that, the email feature. So that's, that's hot off the press. Is connection quality an issue? Um, so we build the system. We architect the solution so that all the heavy lifting happens on Amazon Web Services. So the requests flow over the internet, but the processing isn't happening at the edge. The processing is happening centrally. And so when we trigger that job to happen, it doesn't happen here, it happens over there. So, so the payload is really light between the client application and uh, the server application, um, which is really important. I mean, that's, um, 
if you're not optimizing for the web, it's, you know, you could be a much different experience. So all the heavy lifting happens on a, a very powerful uh, processor and, you know, multi-core, multi-threaded uh, processor that Amazon uh, controls. And we, we also have load balancing built out. So if we have, you know, a surge, then there are other data centers that will spin up uh, and, and take over some of the load. So we're using all, you know, state-of-the-art cloud-based um, techniques. Well, anything else? If anybody wants to be in touch, this is me. So feel free to jot that down or whatever you like. And <laughs> thank you. Thanks again for sticking around.